Okay, there are two types of contemporary philosophers. There are the PowerPoint philosophers and then there are the handout philosophers. And I am the latter. Um, so the handout it should serve as an outline. And there's also a figure on the bottom that I'm going to tell you about. Okay, so as part of my research on civil rights and civic virtues this summer, thus far I've written two academic articles. And the second of the two is more practical. So I'm going to talk about that one so that no one will flee. Um, but I need to give you some background on the first article in order to situate the second. So a long-standing interest of mine is thinking about the phenomenology of virtue or what it feels like to be excellent. Because in the virtue tradition, virtue is not described as a kind of arduous or willful and difficult state. It's not forcing yourself to do good things that you don't want to do. It's described as a kind of happy integration or, or psychic unity. So you think fitting thoughts, you desire good things, and then you do those good things. For example, think about someone in your life who's exceedingly kind, right? They have the excellence of kindness. They're probably not kind to you through gritted teeth. It's something that they want to do. Like there's pleasure taken in the act of being kind. So you want to be kind and kindness flows from your character through well-ordered disposition. You almost can't do otherwise, right? The good person wants to do good. So in thinking about what it's like to be excellent in this way, I've wondered about what emotions dominate a good life, what the virtuous person is inclined to see and to feel. And Aristotle makes this interesting observation in, in one of his texts called the rhetoric. He says that there are two emotions, shame and emulation, and these emotions help us to become good people. For example, shame, which is an emotion everybody hates. Uh, it's known as guilt's ugly sister, right? Shame instructs us in what actions are choiceworthy. It makes us sensitive to the consciences of others and it exposes us to considerations of moral beauty. But shame is like training wheels in the moral life. Once you're a good person, it falls away or it becomes unnecessary. You don't need to be shamed anymore to do the right thing. Emulation is the same. We detect and are pained by the excellences of others and drawn to do and be likewise. But again, once you are virtuous, emulation becomes unnecessary because you're no longer other indexed. You're not looking to other people to figure out what's good. And you don't perceive a personal lack. When you look at this excellent person, you don't see, oh, I lack that thing. You're not pained by that anymore. So in reading Aristotle on emulation and shame, these training wheels are virtue developmental emotions. I wondered whether there were other candidates for similar emotions or capacities, which help us to develop virtues, but then fall away once we have them. And I arrived at guilt and empathy. So that was what I did in article one. I assessed the plausibility and empirical adequacy of emulation and shame as virtue developmental emotions in the way Aristotle describes. Then I made the case that guilt and empathy are also in this category. Why guilt? Well, guilt provides an internal sanction on bad actions, right? It functions like bumpers in a moral bowling alley. But once you're good at bowling, you don't need bumpers anymore. Guilt falls away. And what about empathy? Empathy prompts good actions, but we know from psychological studies that and it, it has a connection to prompting altruistic actions. But it's an interesting capacity because for reasons of psychological fatigue, we find that empathy ceases to characterize those in long-term service work. It prompts good actions, but it can't sustain them. And I don't think that should be surprising after spending the time this week, like in listening to stories and going to museums. Like yesterday after the Legacy Museum, I don't know, I mean, it sounds like there was the common experience of being completely exhausted, right? Because you're encountering these people, you're learning these stories, um, you're sharing in those kinds of perspectives and seeing out from it and that kind of empathy, it takes a lot, like it's psychologically very heavy. So the civic virtue importance here is apparent, right? These emotions are often employed in civil society to motivate good actions. We shame the shameless, for example. We set up role models for young people to emulate. But there are limitations on using these emotions. For example, at some point, we're supposed to advance beyond needing to be ashamed. We're supposed to be 
transitioning to recognizing and loving the good ourselves. So how as a society can we make that happen? Those are implications explored in the first article. Okay, article two, this is the focus here, and I narrowed the focus just to empathy, which was the fourth of the emotions I looked at. I've already said empathy has a curious tendency of prompting good actions, yet failing to sustain them. But in reading about the civil rights period, I kept coming across urgent calls for empathy. Uh, one example is psychologist Kenneth B. Clark. Um, he and his wife, Mamie Phipps Clark, have you heard of them? Uh, they're responsible for that famous doll study where they showed um, young black children uh, dolls that were white and dolls that were black. And overwhelmingly, the children chose the white dolls. Um, and they also would attribute bad qualities to the black dolls and virtues to the white dolls. So they had this kind of internalized um, like discomfort with their own skin color, right? So Kenneth B. Clark, he called for empathy. So did writers James Baldwin, another African-American writer. And they both spoke of empathy's value in overcoming social dissensions. Empathy could bridge relationships between dominant and oppressed groups. And these claims about empathy are not just in the past tense, right? So at Northwestern University, former US President Barack Obama delivered a commencement speech and he referred to what he called a collective empathy deficit. He said, there's a lot of talk in this country about the federal deficit, but I think we should talk more about our empathy deficit, the ability to put ourselves in someone else's shoes, to see the world through those who are different from us, the child who's hungry, the laid off steel worker, the immigrant woman cleaning your dorm room. And while I'm going to argue that this focus on empathy is for good reason, I think um, like in the last talk, Dr. Burroughs talk, we, uh, looked at Bill Riddick's charrettes, right? So they come together, they disagree, they're from different backgrounds. And the reason that kind of like facilitating dialogue or bridging a connection, like those relationships formed, the reason it works is a kind of cognitive empathy. Like you have to um, see out from someone else's perspective and see where they're coming from. Um, I think it was the medieval thinker von Balthasar, he said, in order to understand something, you must first inhabit it, right? You have to step in <laughs> and then see out from that perspective. And so that's why having conversations with people can be so powerful because you have to see out from the other person's perspective in order just to understand them, right? So the focus on empathy is for good reason, but we should also be aware that empathy is a quirky capacity that in other circumstances can actually undermine justice, and it's certainly not a panacea for social ills. Starting with, as I've said, empathy is virtue developmental or training wheels capacity. We know that empathy is not good at sustaining long-term service, and fights for justice are just that. They're arduous, long-term struggles to dismantle systems and change norms. So considering this, I sought to investigate empathy's plausible contributions to service. And what I found in my research was a lot about empathy's kind of uneasy relationship with justice in, in a lot of circumstances. So empathy as probodeutic or preparation for justice. I'm going to do a mix of reading and talking, um, and we're going to end with practical Im implications in terms of like advocacy work. But can you start by telling me what empathy is? Is it reason? Is it emotion? Why is it powerful? Why is it sometimes limited? Yeah? Oh, I was going to say like empathy is trying to um, put yourself in their shoes, trying to understand uh, what, they're, what they're feeling and trying to make it your feeling. Good. Yeah. So taking on the feelings and not not just understanding. Good. Yeah. What else? Why is it powerful? Because it helps you understand. Understanding is good. Yeah. Good. Um. Uh huh. It's like um. It may also strengthen the sense of self. Like a lot of the times, the people around you you see have problems within yourself. So. You know, you're more empathetic towards their situation. So I could have been like that. You know, we went to the same high school with my friend, but I could have been like doing this route. Right. It kind of provided me with a certain motivation of uh, 
it solidified like I say your sense of self. Yeah, good. So it teaches you about yourself and your own capacities. And yeah, it's motivating. We're going to talk about that. Like sometimes it motivates you in terms of changes you can make or solidifies your um, your drive to continue in, in doing certain work. Yeah, and is it emotion? Is it reason? What is it? You think it involves your reason? Good. Um, okay, and then the last thing, can you anticipate any limitations of empathy? How can empathy go wrong? Uh huh? When it comes to killers, um, a lot of people will, if this self defense, you know, you'll have them to use. Yeah, I'm on their side, but at the end of the day, they kill you. Or if, like, if the death comes, I feel like, me personally, nobody has a hand in say if you live or not. But it's just some people you like, you gotta, you gotta draw a line. Um, so in those cases. Great. Yeah. So in legal cases, there are lots of instances of clouding judgment, uh, wanting to align yourself on the other side, like the other side, the unjust side, or um, failing to see, you know, consequences as too heavy because you you aren't empathizing. Yeah. Any other ways you think empathy can go awry? Yes. Sometimes it can be hard if somebody goes against somebody you don't have a poor reason, like. It would be hard for me to want to empathize with somebody who's transphobic, for example, because I play no game in the They're like, so I'm trying to put my own on the team. Like, that could go right within myself. Like, I would have a hard time feeling that in, in those particular instances. So, like, in his talk, we're talking about things that are up for debate, and then the things that aren't necessarily up for debate. Like, empathy in those particular instances is much harder. Do or to want to do um, for some people. Yeah, good. Right. So there are some things that are just not up for grabs, right? And so it, it maybe empathy has like to really empathize and understand. Like there are certain views you're not going to want to inhabit, and so you're kind of limited in in willingness to to align in in those ways. Yeah, good. Uh huh. So I'm a cruel person. I could I could empathize with other folks who are cool in their evil actions and take great delight in it. And so that seems to me like it's the same kind of capacity. But because I'm a cool person, I'm empathizing with all the wrong sort of things and enjoying the feelings of that vicarious cool. Right. Perfect. Yeah. So it's a capacity that can be used to align with just causes, but also with those that are not. Right. And if you see something that is untoward or problematic in someone that resonates with the way that you're also problematic, then that is going to cause not, it's not going to challenge your views. It's going to cause greater solidarity with those who you ought not be collaborating with. Right. Uh -huh. If you're in like a marginalized position um, and you kind of empathize with, you know, your oppressor which I think this actually happens a lot. I think one result of that is sort of an internalized self-hatred. So if I'm, you know, gay and I'm empathizing with, well, I understand why it's so hard for, you know, these people to accept me because, you know, it's understandable that they feel that I'm gross. You know, whatever. Right. Yeah, you can, you can kind of internalize their perspectives. Yeah. Or trauma. Good. And that's a really good point. I mean, it just speaks back to the internalizing, like, white bodies are better in that the children were choosing the white dolls, right? Um, and that kind of, like, self-effacing action of aligning with that narrative. Yeah, good. Mm -hmm. I want to say, maybe that um, it could also go into where I'm internalizing it, and it's better for me. So, yeah, the, my belief is going to but I also realize they're kids to, you know, you are all kids. So me personally, I don't take it as, you know, as harshly as I need to keep, I can feel some sort of peace with myself. Yeah, good. All right. Um, okay, so defining empathy. Uh, empathy, it's a relatively new English word. Uh, it first appeared in 1908, and it was a translation of a German word. Uh, Einfühlung or infeeling, 
Uh, previously, the word sympathy was used in its place. So if you read really old texts, you'll find the word sympathy, and it means pretty much the same thing as empathy. Um, so in the philosophical tradition, we read Kant, Hutchison, David Hume, Adam Smith, they all have this discussion of kind of vicarious pleasures and pains that we take in other people. Um, and this ability, it connects us socially, and it also has moral value, um, which we're going to talk about. So today, in the literature, empathy is characterized as being of two sorts. Um, I asked you whether it was emotional or, or cognitive, um, rational, um, and you drew out both kinds of things in your responses, but yeah, that's right. So there's affective empathy and there's cognitive empathy. Affective empathy, that's emotional in character, um, and it includes emotional contagion when we catch the emotions of other people. Um, this is something, if you've ever been on an airplane and one baby cries and then every baby is crying, uh, they're not thinking, oh, why is that baby sad? It's just that the emotions kind of catch. Um, the same thing happens with positive emotions. So I have a 10 month old and I have a very bad habit of laughing at my own jokes, but she'll laugh along with me. And she doesn't know words, but I trust her judgment. Uh, <laughs> But this same kind of like humor, it's it's like it's catchy, right? You laugh, they laugh, you smile. Um, and this is this really amazing capacity because it binds us socially. Um, it affects like the muscles in our face, pretty neat stuff. Okay, and then cognitive empathy uh, that involves mental perspective taking or recognizing how others think and feel. So the cognitive empathizer can ascribe beliefs, intentions, and emotions to others and can see out from their perspectives. So when you're doing something like walking through a museum and you're learning about the stories of other people um, and you're kind of attributing beliefs or states or kind of anticipating what people are feeling, that is cognitive empathy. So it's rational and it's also emotional. We can experience both at once, right? Affective and cognitive empathy. Um, we can also experience either form independently. And it appears that they're developmentally linked. Uh, so there's a rich literature on the adaptive value of empathy as a core human social ability. Um, and in basic forms, it appears as early as 18 to 72 hours after birth. So it's something that you're born with. Um, like other emotions, empathy matures into a capacity that takes on more cognitive elements. So think about other emotions. Think about anger, for example. When you're a child, uh, you often lack words to describe what you're feeling, right? Or just the kind of self-awareness to be able to identify what's upsetting you. So oftentimes you'll tantrum and can't say why you're mad. But then when you get older, you get better at pointing out Kind of the objects of your anger. So maybe a perceived um, injustice you perceive uh, and maybe you can respond better. And so it takes on these rational components. Um, not in every case, right? I'm sure you know lots of people who are angry for bad reasons toward bad objects in outsized ways, but as you mature, you can acquire this sort of ability um, a way in which rationality intrudes upon your emotions in a certain way. And that happens with empathy. It becomes more reasoned as we mature. So if you look at your handout, I put a little developmental model. It looks like a kind of like a, a Russian doll, right? There's an inner and then two outer layers. Um, this is Franz Duval's model of empathy. He's an ethologist. So he looks at emotions relevant to the moral life in animals. Um, he's known as like a monkey guy, really into the, the monkeys, um, and then also humans. So we have this kind of evolved um, and developmental ability of empathy. So at its core, we have that emotional contagion, right? That catchiness. So sadness catches other people and so forth. Um, and that's the basic naive germ of the emotion. It's held in common among humans and some higher sentient animals. Level two is cognitive empathy, right? So you take on that cognitive character and involves the appraisal of another situations and, and targeted helping behavior. And older children can do that and also some apes. So there's an example that Francis Wall is famous for and it's about this bonobo. He, his name is Cooney and he's in a, I forget what zoo it is, 
but a bird, a little starling, falls into his cage, right? And, and everyone's like, oh no, like the bonobo Cooney is gonna eat the bird. And instead, Cooney picks up the little starling and crawls to the top of the highest tree and in its little enclosure. And it tosses the bird upward because it seems to have some sense that flying is what's good for a bird. Right, so it's thinking in terms of what the other's need is, and that's that kind of cognitive empathy. I mean, the story didn't end that well. He actually threw the starling a little bit too hard, and its neck smacked on the cement embankment. But you know, noble intentions. <laughs> he was trying to do his best to help this bird, right? And then the final level is attributional empathy. That's the most advanced. And the attributional empathizer can share in and see out from the other's perspective. So not just kind of import your sense of what that being needs, but see out from their perspective. And that is called a uniquely human capacity. Dewall says this is a difference in kind from the layers of empathy that precede it. Um, and it's both rational and it's effective. So that is the objective, right? But I want to note something about empathy's development, which is that in the same way that we might be capable of being mature in our anger, yet not be, right? You might have a short fuse or get angry at the wrong things. You kick a table and you get mad at the table, right? Just because you're capable of attributional empathy, accurately appraising the state of others and sharing in their emotions, it doesn't mean you're excellent in that respect, right? We have to intentionally practice being well-ordered or excellent in our empathy. Uh, empathizing when we ought to, with who we are, seeing and valuing others suitably, not just people who look like us and responding in fitting ways when we do. So oftentimes in popular discourse, we say things about needing to empathize more, but it's not just more, right? We don't just need more volume of empathizing poorly, right? Um, in the ways that we don't just necessarily want more anger. It's about using that capacity in excellent ways. And it's really interesting, if you look at a population level of empathy, there are some people who are the deep feelers, but there are clinical levels of empathizing too much, such that you're always weighed down by the perspectives of other people and that you are almost incapacitated. Like you can't act on that ability to share in because you are just extremely empathetic. And so that is not like a flourishing way of empathizing. And then there are people on the other side of the spectrum who emphasize, empathize very little, right? So we wanna take the opportunities that we ought to in empathizing with different sets of people and so forth. Uh, but the objective is really to be excellent in our empathy, sharing in and then acting appropriately once we have that needed perspective. Okay, empathy and justice. Um, in this section, I'm going to assess empathy and connection to virtue, focusing on its potential value in supporting justice and its vulnerabilities to that end. So its value. There are two kinds of ben benefits that empathy offers. Epistemic, and that's knowledge relaying, the kind of information you gain. And then the second is motivational. And motivational is inclining us to perform certain actions. At a 1964 New York City town hall roundtable, um, African-American writer James Baldwin, he noted a divide between himself and the white men present. Uh, failure to see the world in the same way, which he described as akin to blindness. He described the white liberal as being blinded to the fact that in talking to a black man, he's talking to another man like himself, right? There's this kind of wall they couldn't see. It's unsurprising that empathy was championed in the civil rights period because of its value in transforming vision. This is empathy's epistemic role. When we empathize with others, we inhabit another perspective and learn to see things from their vantage. For a society in which racism was entrenched and still is, the ability to see the water they were in and to notice how others were faring in that water would be invaluable. Empathy could do the work in transforming vision so that people could see the humanity and condition of the oppressed. But seeing pain, and even feeling it alongside of them is not sufficient to affect change. We also need a motivational role, being moved to act on their behalf. 
For example, imagine learning that a co coworker doing comparable work to you is paid less than everyone in the office and you feel sad for him and perhaps with him, right? But then you do nothing. That's a kind of publicity, right? So we need to be motivated to act. And, and it's you can't even claim ignorance at that point, right? You're aware, you're connected and not acting. Another example is maybe spending a week going to museums and seeing the evil of slavery and lynching and inhabiting the stories told to the people there then doing nothing about it, right? So we need to act on the new knowledge that's been afforded to us that we gain by way of empathizing. Otherwise our empathy is not well-ordered, it's not excellent empathy. Empathy does in fact motivate good actions. Um, if you're interested, I recommend you look at um, Batson's work uh, on the empathy altruism hypothesis. It's the hypothesis that empathy tends to motivate actions directed at improving another state. Briefly, we know that inducing empathy can make children more receptive to negotiation, compromise, and successful conflict resolution that can only occur between relative equals. So it causes this like an equaling effect where you can have conversations. Being asked how someone feels before asking for their help significantly increases helping rates and the length of time participants help. Empathy experiencing children and college students are more generous with their time and money respectively. And when a victim shows more pain, like is crying or something like that, we're inclined to help more. Well, let's talk about the motivation to act because it's important for considerations of virtues like justice. There's a common intuition in virtue theory that motivations or why you act transform the nature of an action. So imagine this. You jump into a lake because you see a drowning child. And I say, wow, that is a courageous person. However, I later find out that you jumped in not because you perceived the boy's life to be worth saving, but because you saw a newscaster present and wanted to be famous. In retrospect, I would be less likely to attribute to you the virtue of courage because this selfish motivation undermines the goodness of the action. When we think about helping others, the intuition is that these actions should be about other people, not about us, not about our fame or even our self-satisfaction. Uh, just acts should be about the people that you're helping. The relevance here is that I've already noted that our empathetic experiences involve us taking on the distress of others. But if resolving our own empathic distress is the motivation for, for performing good actions, these actions actually become about us rather than about the people we're helping. To be clear, they're still good actions and can be socially productive, such as in the case when empathy motivates us to advocate for the oppressed, but this self-interested motivation disqualifies them as virtuous actions. Just and helpful actions are about the people being helped, not about the alleviation of our own unease. So you need to see and act on their behalf, not just take away your negative feelings. Okay, empathy's limitations. There are many. In a well-known study by Batson, uh, participants are told about a child with a fatal condition. She's low on the wait list for an experimental drug that may improve her condition. Participants are asked whether they'd like to advocate for the girl to receive the drug over others on the wait list ahead of her, and most say no. The experiment is repeated, but with one change. They ask participants to consider how the girl feels. And in this condition, the empathy condition, most participants agree to advocate for the girl, right? To move her up the wait list in front of people who are deemed worthier to be on the list, right? So empathy outshines impartial justice concerns in that case. There are many reasons to be concerned about empathy's role in affecting justice. The first and perhaps most damning reason is reflected in the Batson study I just introduced. It biases us in favor of those we know with whom we empathize. We tend to empathize with those who are ethnically similar to ourselves, our friends, and our kin. We empathize more with attractive women and unattractive men. Uh, we also empathize with those who are part of our in-group and those who are here now. So we have a hard time with um, knowing something like a child is starving 
in this country over there. Well, if you can't see them now, empathy is probably not going to be initiated, right? And it's a capacity that's partial or localist. Uh, it improves solidarity with our own. And partiality is not in itself a problem, right? So think about parenting or marriage, right? You favor your own kids, your spouses over others, and it would be odd if you didn't, right? If you treated, you know, your husband and some stranger over here like entirely the same, that would be odd, right? So partiality is not itself a problem. But a worry is that partiality does not track what's just unless justice is defined by how uh, Paul Marcus defines it in Plato's Republic. He, he says it's loving one's friends and harming one's enemies, right? So empathy favors the in-group, irrespective of the character of the in-group or the actions required to support them. For example, think of the actions one might perform to love one's in-group, given that their in-group is the mafia, these actions may be loyal, but they're unlikely to be just. Also, cognitive scientist Paul Bloom, he writes that empathy is often used by those who wish to generate animus toward outgroups. Lynchings in the American South, for instance, were motivated in part by stories told about white women raped by black men. For the sake of clarifying the conceptual geography among different emotions, I think Bloom's statement that empathy generated animus is not quite right. It seems that the rape stories themselves motivated negative emotions like fear, disdain, or anger. But it is true that often the in-group love and out-group disdain appear in tandem, right? These emotions aren't found in a vacuum. They're often accompanied by negative emotions that sustain the same kind of in-group. Right. So it's not just a matter of partiality of resources. We often actively dislike things that are not us. So think of opposing sports teams. So uh, Auburn at Montgomery, who is your foe? What is the opposing team? <laughs> okay, but you know, th that was very impassioned what you did yell out, right? And so there's this kind of like love of the in group accompanied by disdain for things that are not the in group, right? Um, or have you ever heard of Rudyard Kipling's poem, We and They? I um, just find all the nice people like us are we and everyone else is they, right? You like the niceness of our in group and also dislike the things that are in the out group. Um, so disdain and empathy often arrive together. So with Bloom, I agree that those concerned with justice should note that empathy is not incompatible with and has historically been accompanied by out group disdain and other justice undermining objectives. And this is a practical liability of empathy. Favor is often sustained or accompanied by hatred of the other. Someone might wonder why Given this liability, there is such a glut of literature on empathy and altruism, right? That empathy is in these studies connected to increasing good actions, as I earlier described. What's interesting about the study cited earlier about empathy's role in increasing helping behavior is that in these cases, the good or helpful actions had already been selected for the participants of the study. So it'll be an example is like, will you help this struggling girl? No? Okay, well, imagine how she feels, right? And then it's like, oh, okay, then I will help the struggling girl. But it's not like weighing one action versus others in terms of partiality considerations. Uh, the good actions are picked out and prompted. The studies don't measure the partiality of various possible good actions. They measure the magnitude of participation in these pre-selected good actions. So to harness empathy's power for good, perhaps we should aim to elicit empathy with respect to specific good or justice tracking actions, helping this family here or advocating for this cause rather than assuming that empathy can select out which action is the right one to perform. Empathy has other limitations in supporting justice. One is that it appears to be a Goldilocks capacity, right? So earlier I described how empathy uh, experiencing empathy long-term can be really emotionally onerous, right? It's draining. Often those engaged in long-term service work cease to act from empathy because sharing in the burdens of others while initially motivating can wear on a person. Additionally, if empathic arousal is too salient or intense, uh, 
Even in the short term, this can be aversive for the empathizer and cause him to retreat. So if someone's really suffering and they invite you to empathize with them, they share their stories and it's just too much, you push it away, right? But the opposite is also true. If empathic arousal is insufficiently arousing, we're unlikely to act from empathy, right? So the too intense and the not intense enough. So empathy's value is found in terms of moderate empathic arousal for short periods of time. It precludes the kinds of injustices we might find too intense or too emotionally distressing. So as a candidate for recognizing and sustaining good actions, there are reasons to worry about empathy's value. Okay, implications for advocacy. Uh, this talk began with the call for empathy in the civil rights era. Um, Lanzoni uh, describes how in light of the movement to desegregate schools and extend civil rights, calls for empathy were considered urgent. And we can certainly understand why, right? When we empathize with others, we see their humanity and develop personal investments in their plights, then act on their behalf. We've already explored empathy's localist or neighborly interests and how these square with outgroup empathy. In this section, I'm gonna advance the conversation about empathy and justice, arguing that empathy does have a role in breaking down social barriers, but given everything we've learned about empathy so far, the narrative of empathy facilitating systematic change seems unlikely to be successful for three kinds of reasons. And those three reasons are on your handout. So reason one, Systematic change needs to precede emotional change, not the other way around. So we empathize with those who are immediately before us. It's something Hoffman, a psychologist, calls the here and now bias. There are two worries about this bias for social change. The first is that empathy is presentism, right? That it focuses on here and now. It's at odds with long-term strategizing. So you might wonder about how best to spend resources, where to invest energy and attention in building a community that either implicitly or explicitly is inhospitable to certain groups. Empathy may not provide guidance in these respects. Its focus will be on providing immediate relief or resolving current discontents, which we feel ourselves, rather than setting up systems that take a long time to enact or that have bequest value for future populations. Of course, this present-centered focus on empathy is not, strictly speaking, a problem. For example, in famine, a fitting course of action could be to support long-term initiatives to resolve food insecurity and provide immediately relief. So these people now do not starve. We should care about the people immediately before us. But acting only from empathy restricts the kinds of decisions we make to favor the people and problems as they present themselves currently. And this is just something about empathy to be aware of. A second worry is that if certain groups of people are excluded from shared spaces, right? So all that conversation of separate but equal, they're not here now. So empathy cannot do its work in transforming vision. Rather, empathy can only exacerbate social separation by strengthening relationships among people we already encounter on a regular basis. And it can increase the amount of attention and resources we extend to those in our inner circle at the expense of those outside the circle. Given the here and now bias, an effective strategy is to address broken systems in place, increasing the access that oppressed people have to shared spaces, such as educational institutions, places of employment first, and then empathy can follow and solidify relationships once that access is in place. As described by Susan Lanzoni, this is in fact what did take place during the civil rights period. So the movement to desegregate schools preceded calls for empathy. So black people were here and now, such that the call for empathy worked with, instead of against the grain of empathy's nearsightedness. You can't wait for empathy to prompt big institutional changes. You need to do the institutional changes and empathy can follow. A final consideration is that I've already said we empathize more with kin and with those who resemble us. To a certain extent, these biases can be overcome. For example, psychologist Jason Onakafua, uh, he found that teachers extend more severe disciplinary measures toward black students, labeling them troublemakers. But when empathic response training is implemented, the teachers build relationships with students and suspension rates are cut in half. 
Absent these kinds of interventions, empathy is a liability rather than an asset in race relations. But with a bit of encouragement in this direction, we can empathize with people who are different from us. So yes, it's biased against our groups, but that is something that empirically or from psychological studies we know can be overcome. And this is an important reminder that to mobilize empathy in favor of those we may not otherwise favor should be an intentional process. As a reminder from the earlier section, empathizing more is not our only objective. We wanna be excellent in our empathy, using this capacity to recognize others' distress, adequately appraise their needs and be motivated to act for their good, offering aid that is indeed helpful. Okay, the second, expanding the circle of those you empathize with is not a given, right? So an obvious answer or one that I've read repeatedly um, about um, how to address empathy's limited scope um, is to cast our empathy more broadly, right? Or to deliberately empathize with people outside of our inner circle. I may imagine if empathy leads me to show preference for others, I can just empathize with everyone. For example, I can take my children to a park where they'll encounter people from different backgrounds and ethnicities. I can make friends with the people in the park and I can encourage my children to do the same. I can read stories or watch quality films about people who are not, who don't look like me. I can live in a mixed race neighborhood. I can get to know my neighbors and be intentional about considering life from other people's perspectives. There are many ways to expand empathy scope beyond my narrow circles. Positioning yourself to expand your realm of cares is valuable and productive. And these ideas are a great start, but it's important to note that the strategy is also limited, is also limited by our own emotional energy reserves. So as it turns out, there are limits to how far we can expand our circle of empathy. We're unable to empathize with too many people at once. The term in the empathy literature, it's called promiscuous empathy or diffuse empathy. It's empathizing broadly with as many people as possible. And it's exhausting, right? Um, it leads to a kind of over arousal. So it becomes personally distressing to share in the perspectives of too many people at the same time. So while theoretically it seems like we should just be able to expand the circle of those we empathize with infinitely outward, we're limited in emotional and intentional attentional resources. This means we need to be selective and intentional about those with whom we empathize and manage our energy in that respect suitably. As a reminder, there are other emotions, right? There's not just empathy, <laughs> you can lean into compassion, caring for others without sharing perspectives, um, caring in general, right? So there are lots of other emotions you don't have to just empathize. But practically speaking, learning, leaning too much into empathy can be depleting. Okay, and then the last one, changing systems is a long-term commitment and empathy is not a long-term capacity. So along similar lines, the final worry is using empathy to facilitate systematic change narrative is that empathy cannot sustain good actions long-term. This is for two reasons. The first is over arousal, right? So the term is empathic distress fatigue. Those who serve in positions of care can experience vicarious distress and deep fatigue if they continue to act from empathy. Interestingly, we know that those who work in service positions long-term are unlikely to self-describe as acting from empathy. So doctors you encounter in you know, the emergency room long-term or people who are long-term missionaries and things like that, they're not seeing out from the perspective of others. And you might think of that as a kind of like, uh, like I think we're primed to think of that as a kind of deficit, but it's not, right? Because there are other ways of caring. Um, people often think unempathetic is the same thing as non-emotional, and that is a mistake, right? So it's just kind of like guarding um, how much you are able to long-term enter into the perspectives of others. Okay, so this is an interesting finding because ostensibly those in positions of care would benefit from perspective sharing and vicarious feeling that empathy offers. This capacity would facilitate their good work, but for reasons of fatigue, Empathy is not a good candidate for sustaining service. The relevance here is that insofar as challenging norms and rebuilding institutions are not short-term projects, empathy is limited in the kinds of contributions it can make. Mm -hmm. Asking ourselves how someone feels or appraising their plight for years on end may not be sustainably 
for sustainable for approaching things personally. Two possibilities here for sustaining good actions are putting in place good habits of care and creating systems that keep us grounded and attending to the concerns of others. An example of developing is developing the habit of listening well. Instead of relying on empathy to prompt me to consider the perspective of another, I could build a habit of fair-mindedness or intellectual charity, practicing listening to other people even, or especially when I disagree. I can develop a habit of putting others first or giving a percentage of my income to advocacy projects. This way, regardless of whether I presently bear the distress of another in my conscience as empathy, there's inertia toward thoughtfully considering the perspectives of others and caring for them. And that extends the idea that Dr. Burroughs talked about, right? So virtues are acquired intentionally. How do you become more just? You practice justice. How do you become a better listener? You force yourself to listen well again and again until it defines you in a stable way. That's the best part about virtues. It takes the guesswork out of how to become a better person. You just have to practice in the same way that, you know, if you want to run a 5K, you just like put your shoes on again and again and get out the door until you're like better at doing it. And then the second systems, um, and that's the kind of community wide broader protections, um, advocacy work, um, providing ways um, to elevate the voices of people who are not often heard, um, and so forth. So that's all I have for you. Uh, in regard to, say, health, um, is it possible for empathy to get in, to actually get in the way of proper health care? I'm sure that it does, right? I, I mean, I'm sure that there are some situations of clouding judgment or um, like making choices without long-term considerations, right? That kind of presentism or not listening to what other people say because you're thinking out from the perspective. I think um, one thing that's often talked about in healthcare ethics is that sometimes the patient isn't positioned to know what's in their best interest. And so if you are just seeing, if you're sharing in or seeing out from their emotions or just mirroring what they see for themselves, maybe there's a kind of professional judgment clouding that could come with that for sure. But I think, I mean, a big part of it is just day after day, caring for people is it's tiring. And, and part of that is just what it means to be human, right? We should bear the burdens of other people. That's what it means to love and be present. But then also you need to be able to manage yourself so that your investments in you know, serving others is something that's long-term. Um, so you just tried a child, young, so I have children too, and development, is there a time development where your empathy starts to really, you, you mentioned it's like at birth, but I'm, let's say I'm not always saying that, <laughs> but like it's really more of an elemental trajectory, like where they, like they were born with it, but it starts to happen and kind of how you, Maybe not interfere with that as a parent, but right? if you could overthink that sometimes or do weird things, I don't know. So, but you might be in a position that it's an Um, yeah. So, I mean, in terms of the immediate state matching, um, that is what happens right away, like right after birth. But in terms of like taking on cognitive elements and seeing out from other perspectives and being interested in other people and other minds, like awareness that. You know, this person is not seeing the world precisely as I am. I think that's a nurtured capacity. And that's part of our education, right? That's part of why we expose children to like a breadth of literature and, and not just this like niche of people who have the same worldview as me, like exposing them broadly to stories or films or things that expose them differently. I think the cognitive elements are something that you know, by access to other people and stories and things like that, that's that's consciously cultivated. I mean, the effective thing, the the sharing in, that's something, I mean, that seems to take care of itself because it's just present there in that way. Um, 
but yeah, the, the cognitive part, like we got to educate that, make sure that, that they do have exposure. Um, I've been looking at, right, so I have a three-year-old now, and just looking at all the characters and her books, and a lot of her books are the books that I grew up reading, and it's a lot of, you know, little smiley white girls, and like, is that, are those the only stories that she should be reading, or I should have been reading, like, why did I just have this, they all have, like, little houses, like, nobody lives in an apartment, nobody, like, has a different experience, and so, just trying to broaden her access to people who are not like her, um, who have different um, needs, are differently able, different backgrounds, and so forth. Going off of kids in terms of empathy, kids are a lot more perceptive than we give them credit for. So how do you explain to them, like, the concept of empathy? Yeah, I don't know if you, uh, I don't know if you need to, to use the words of empathy, right? So I, you know, I ask, so my three-year-old, sometimes she'll whack her baby sister and I'll say, like, how, how do you think that makes her feel, right? Just like prompting them to kind of see how, um, from the other perspective, is like a great way of introducing, oh, our actions have like consequences for other people, like that, that sort of thing. <laughs> okay, um, so I just want to get understanding. So uh, earlier on, um, Dr. Cox, he asked a question about um, how can empathy how can we prevent from being scripted? And this is something you it's for us, like, uh, you say the limitation of empathy is the same. And you mentioned something about poem about David. And my thing is, I was trying to make, find a way to connect it. So, with that basically being saying, um, the saying, well, my, the enemy of my enemy is not, is my friend, that basically what that was going to work. Um, so, the worry is just that if you empathize without, like being critically aware of the kind of perspective that you're sharing in. I mean, just because someone is your friend or your in group, it doesn't mean that you are on, you know, that they're loving or they're doing the just thing, right? And so empathy is really a neutral capacity with respect to the value it brings, morally speaking, right? If it increases groupthink and solidarity in a group of people that is oppressing another group, then that is not beneficial. Um, morally speaking, it's not on the side of pursuing justice. And so just bringing sort of a critical eye to yourself and knowing in some cases, you know, your empathy is going to cloud your judgment instead of helping you to see people better and attend to them better. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Little, um, um, it occurs to me, as you were talking about the need for systematic change, I was pushing emotional change, that one of the call it features from a perverse sense of uh, segregation is that it reduced exposure of, of white people to black people and therefore precluded empathy. Um, how do we break through that, though? If, you have to rely, with per your earlier point, uh, that you have to rely on empathy to get white people to sympathize with black people in the first place. Empathize, I should say. Right, yeah, the problem of beginnings, right? How do you initiate the movement? Um, and, you know, I, I asked something to Nancy Snow yesterday, and she said something about, well, it starts with small conversations with people sitting down at the table with your neighbor, right, having these conversations. So it's probably a bit of a both and, right? You have to see the humanity in order to initiate changes. And then once those changes are in place, more broadly, like maybe it's a sort of like, I don't know, you get the waterfall effect of people actually, like once you're together, you're, you have opportunities to see people, but, but I think it might, might be the case that it has to, you have to have those initial kinds of interactions in order to get the systematic change such that you can empathize. Yeah, it's a really good question. 
So, you know, we um, have plans to do more service in our communities. So you've made me think about what is that role that individual play. And in the morning, we're going to meet with some um, nonprofit leaders from around the city. I'm sure we'll feel a lot of empathy as we talk with them. Um, and that, you know, hearing your message, empathy is not going to sustain us. You know, we need when it's hot in here. But um, but you see the role of it, maybe in helping us select or helping us serve in ways that are respectful of others. What do you what do you think as, as we pursue that as part of the spring? What what role does it be? Yeah, I think seeing uh, their state, seeing what they actually need, right? So in the empathy literature, it talks about like targeted helping behavior, like actually giving them what they need instead of what we paternalistically think from our like, you know, me sitting in my academic chair think that they need, right? So like actually having that kind of face-to-face -face thing. I think just the urgency in um, empathy won't sustain the good action is just that when you have those moments of recognition, you need to make those personal changes, right? You need to do the soul making of, of building the good virtuous habits. You need to like, initiate like create some sort of community of momentum around those sorts of things such that systems can change too it's just not letting right so i could have gone to the museum yesterday felt really sad and heavy go home and then carried on with the rest of my life right you don't want your empathy to be inert in that way and so it's when you feel it like make the changes, right? Compel yourself, like set up those systems. And I think also there's a kind of renewal that comes from community, expo like ex being exposed to different people and different stories. And, and that kind of, it's a kind of refreshment of like, well, what is the vision here, right? Just like continually entering into those times of service or continually sitting down with people who are not, you know, like you. And then also doing the hard work of, of building habits Dr. Little, thank you for your presentation. I, I wonder, uh, so you know, the title empathy is appropriate to justice. Um, from there, um, how justice is functioning? Is justice functioning in simply as a descriptor of social relationships, or is it also potentially a virtue? And is maybe this what we're aiming at is you know maybe an initial sort of flame of empathy, but that's sort of being hardened into an ongoing virtue of justice, or or how should I read that? Yeah, it's interesting. And <laughs> Because as I was writing the paper, like I went in, you know, the party line is empathy, get you ready for justice, right? Popadudic is just preparation for justice. Um, and it became more of a question. Is it preparation for justice? Like that kind of like, I don't know, just seeing the kind of uneasy relationship it had with justice throughout, it became more of a question to me than, oh yes, it is strictly kind of a training wheels of motion such that it readies you for justice. In terms of how I was treating justice here, I was treating it as a virtue, right? So the kind of um, excellence with respect to seeing and responding to the needs of other, other people, giving to them what's, what's due to them. What do Ask about um, the needs, the sense, I think the word, the sensitization of a lot of the things that goes on, especially with social media, um, especially me being the early 2000s baby growing up. I see the community kid person that they, you know, I see homeless people walking on the street. I see, you know, tons of mothers crying because they want their kids. And then I feel like at some point, you know, a lot of people turn on to that. So you can stay on a topic like what ways do you recommend? Like how could I exercise myself so that I can, you know, not go somewhere or if I am just try to just break the ice. Yeah, um <clears throat> great question. And I would return to you know what Nancy Snow said about the kinds of communities where you're like um uh, in part like receiving some of the hope, right? So that kind of like participation as kind of like a, like a way of, of strengthening you and in, in your resolve in certain ways. I also think it's it's really valuable to limit yourself on social media just because it's 
I mean, it's a waterfall of things to care about and it's overwhelming. And so, I mean, part of our, part of our responsibility living in this social climate where it's like our public squares online is kind of digital temperance, like being aware of how much time you are, you're dedicating to the online spaces and just being present where you are. And oftentimes when you're present where you are, it's a great way of, you know, becoming sensitive to the things that are in your reach that you can change, right? This kind of awareness to, to people around you, right? Um, like if, you know, it, I mean, when you're walking across a college campus, for example, and everybody has their head down and they're like on their phones, that's not a great way of being receptive to the needs of your classmates around you or having conversations. And, and oftentimes having those conversations, you know, you hear a classmate need help or there's something happening in your city or something like that. And, and so sometimes putting your phone down is the best way to both be refreshed, but also be present and aware of like the needs in your current area. I'd like to ask, uh, so Lisa Tesman has a, you know, as you know, it's this work on burden virtues of which compassion, she, she talks about compassion as a, as a virtue that's burdened in, in many ways. And so I also say where it work, but some of the things you said about empathy can make, make it sound a lot like that. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could distinguish a little bit between empathy and compassion in terms because compassion is often construed as a virtue. It's not clear to me, it seems to me that you're saying that empathy, even though you can talk about a sort of excellence in empathy, you are, you're not calling it a virtue per se, right? So um, distinguishing between compassion and empathy is one question. And then thinking about empathy as a sort of burden state and, and what that means. So yeah, okay, so um, in the psychology literature, there was something for a while that was called compassion fatigue. And compassion fatigue, you're in a position as caretaker, and it's weighty to do that, right? If you've ever had a family member who's sick, or you are really plugged in and caring for your community in a certain way, there's a kind of fatigue that's generated. And recently, the word was changed from compassion fatigue to empathy fatigue, because they realized that it wasn't actually compassion that was weighing the people down. It was the kind of um, like sharing in the distress of others that was causing the fatigue. And so you can work from a place of compassion, extending care, um, working alongside with people, but it's more, it's less of like that kind of entering in. Um, and so they realized it was actually, and, and now they call it like empathic distress syndrome. Um, so they distinguish it in the literature from like this compassion fatigue idea because compassion is actually less fatiguing. And so oftentimes when, when, um, when you're offloading empathy, it's like, oh, well, does that mean I don't care about people anymore? No, it means leaning into other emotions, right? And so compassion is one, one candidate, kind of working in and, and um, caring alongside, and also not being, not doing the work of perspective sharing. Um, and then in terms of burden virtues, so the idea of burden virtues is that under conditions of oppression, there are certain excellences that you have to develop that are kind of contingent upon being in a less than flourishing state, right? So if you're a person who is oppressed um, or you're in a state of like, you know, looking at everything we saw yesterday in terms of slavery, like there are certain kinds of bad situations where you're not gonna be optimally flourishing, right? There's no such thing. And so there are certain kinds of excellences that you can develop that help you through those times. And one of them is compassion. Um, and I don't know, it's, it's hard to say like where certain emotions and like where certain virtues fit into like an oppressed schema versus in society. Like society is so broken in so many ways that I wonder like, are we all in the state of burden virtues? Like what excellence is like resilience? No one wants to be resilient. It means you've been smacked down so many times that you had to develop this excellence. Um, and so compassion is one of those, like a lot of people are suffering. And so 
you put on this excellence that that assists you in that context. And the, I think part of the story for her is, but it's the alternative would be worse, right? Right. Right. So just not having that is would be awful. So although you develop this trait, and it's not optimal for you, at the certain it, it indicates that it's the only way for you to sort of make your way through that. It's bad for you in a way, right. or it reflects badness in a way. But it's the alternative would be worse, right? That is to have no compassion or, or whatever would be horrible. So right, yeah. yeah. I don't need anything. <laughs> <Not, laughs> the recording. <laughs> right. You, you talk about it. You know, how empathy can bridge between the, the dominant and the oppressor. But uh, I'm struggling. All right. Why do the oppressed empathize with the oppressor? All right. Can you help me with that? Um, that is a great question, right? Um, and I think there's a there's a magnitude gap there too, right? So if you're a victim, like the harms that you experience are worse than the oppressor feels that they have done to you, right? And so there's even like a lack of shared vision in like what actually like the transgression that's been done. And so there is this kind of like psychic divide or disunity, right? Like inability to share in perspective in a certain way with an oppressor. Um, I don't know how in many cases people would empathize with an oppressor. I know that on certain um, certain faith traditions, it's what you're called to do, right? To like absorb, um, it, absorb the harms done to you, but I think it's the hardest thing in, in life to do, right? To forgive or to see out from someone's perspective, especially when they're not repentant or there are active harms and things like that. So I think that's a great question and, and I don't have the answer. It's not going to be one more. They didn't have any answer for why the oppress should um should have the oppressor. Um, I think a way a way to look at it is um when you empathize with them, you it's not necessarily trying to make their feelings your own feelings, but maybe like I I'm trying to see where you're coming from, so I don't do that stuff. Yeah, I think yeah, good. Right. So kind of empathy to understand, not not a condoning. But a, an understanding, right? Good. Yeah, okay. one more actually. Um, I wanted to ask: Would you say that when when you're overwhelmed, when you're feeling, um, you know, you're putting yourself in everybody's position? You mentioned the extreme of it, pushing everybody away or pushing the way. Would you feel like? Would you say that it's okay? Because of how long it is, or is there a constructive way that um, you can lay it out? I guess. Other than cry, I mean, sometimes. <laughs> cry and go to sleep. Is that what you said? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I'm not saying, right? So, empathy has certain, like, you have a, your own emotional constitution and you know how much you can bear on a regular basis. Right, so if you are tapped out, right, not empathizing is like, you know, leaning into other moral emotions. I'm not saying don't care, stop caring, right? That's not the solution, but it's that same question of self-care, right? And sometimes it's like retreating and then returning, right? Um, but, but the solution is not, I'm a sensitive person, therefore I should just like live alone or not not shoulder any of these things like part of being human is empathizing and it's like a very powerful capacity and also it has limitations 